Welcome, everybody. We have got a fantastic guest joining us today, and I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. But first, I want to share a word from our sponsors. The Pressing Limits podcast is brought to you by ZionMissionaryChurch.net, and that's where you can listen and watch messages, share prayer requests, or even find out how to plan a visit. And also by the newly updated NeuropowerSource.com. Resources for your mind, your body, and your spirit. There's discount codes for all the recommended gear that I use, including the Be Strong Blood Flow Restriction Bands. You'll want to be sure to check it out. Let me tell you about our guest today. Dr. Carlos Berrio is among the most highly trained sports fitness and physical therapy professionals in the D.C. metro area. He's been working with clients across a very wide spectrum of health and fitness levels since 1998. Dr. Carlos, he utilizes all kinds of sports and fitness techniques to help reduce pain and improve sport and play as well as performance. He has an extensive background in these areas. He earned his bachelor's degree in kinesiology from the University of Maryland at College Park and subsequently earned his master's degree in clinical exercise physiology from George Washington University. His education is rounded out by a doctoral degree in physical therapy, which he uses to help his clients become pain-free, something we're going to talk a lot about today, and reach their maximum performance. Carlos' passions lie in attaining the client and understanding rehab and his goals with rehab, as well as the highest performance that they can achieve. Because of his attention to detail, his unique treatment style, and his priority on -on one-on-one care, he moves the client from pain to undergoing a massive, amazing transformation in their physical conditions and abilities. Carlos derives the most satisfaction from the realization that his clients become highly educated in the technical aspects of their body, and how the entire chain functions as a whole. With all that being said, welcome to the show, Dr. Barrio. Thank you very, very much. That's an amazing intro. Man, it's worth the price of admission right there. Love it. Well, you're just so you know involved in so many different things and have such a unique style, and we want to get into that. Um, what inspired you to go into physiotherapy, and can you kind of give us some of the background about how all that came about? Oh, sure, sure. So uh, like you said, I've been in uh, health and human performance uh, since about 1998. Uh, Round about 2002, uh, 2003 timeframe when I'd wrapped up my master's, uh, I was seeing a lot of people um, for human performance primarily. And, um, you know, at the at that stage, uh, you would run into instances where people would get dinged up. You know, they're playing a sport uh, or they're being their best competitive moving self. And, uh, you know, Back aches would creep in and knee pain and hip pain. And uh, I primarily was working with rotary power athletes as a baseball athlete myself at the time. And uh, so um, technically, if you punch it, kick it, throw it, swing it, you know, you're a rotary power athlete. Uh, And so I was having an issue um, getting my training regimens to uh, align with appropriate mobility and pain reduction regimens. And so I thought, well, I could continue to sort of work around these kinds of pains and, and uh, you know, I could program around all that pretty easily, but I wanted to be able to affect pain a little bit more directly. And so uh, taking my strength and conditioning knowledge and my knowledge of human performance and rotary power athletes at that time, I said, let's, let's go back to school. Let's uh, see what I'm missing. And uh, thank goodness I did. Uh, because I really thought at that time I was a pretty solid trainer and I was a really good coach. And uh, it opened my eyes to all the layers that exist uh, inside of pain, inside of mobility, inside of uh, neuromotor kind of programming that we use day to day to get people better now. So uh, that was uh, what led me into it. And, and uh, we've been going uh, as Spark Physiotherapy since 2009, kicking some tail. I, I love all of that because it's so important because – you actually, you know, have the title as the pain Jedi and want to talk about how you came up with that. But most people are in some serious pain. We've been taught to gut through it, to work through it. I remember for years and years and years until I got into biohacking and some different things, you just push through pain. You just accept it as part of life. You accept that you're not going to be able to sleep at night because your shoulders ache all the time. 
and it just becomes a part of life. You know, it's kind of like your cross to bear. So how did you come up with this whole name, The Pain Jedi? And let's talk a little bit more in a few minutes about how you get people out of pain. Of course, of course. So The Pain Jedi, I think, uh, came about when I was discussing with some colleagues uh, a more appropriate and approachable uh, title for what we do. Um, the, the term physical therapy is really, really broad. Uh, I think if someone were to ask you at a bar, hey, what do you do for a living? If you told them physical therapist, they probably think orthopedic physical therapy. They think, oh, my golfer's elbow, my stenosis, my hip pain. Um, but there are so many kinds of physical therapists. Uh, I have colleagues who are in pediatrics and colleagues who are in Jerry and who colleagues who um, do all manner of other work that is not orthopedic. And if you were to ask that person at a bar, hey, what about my elbow? They wouldn't know what the hell they were looking at. <laughs> it would just be, well, do you have CP? Uh, do you have problems integrating certain reflexes? Because I'm a pediatric PT and I really can't help you. And, and even still, Still, the term physical therapy, because people typically think of orthopedics, um, they also think of um, the volume-driven places, uh, which we knew we didn't want to be, Um, places that throw a hot pack on everyone and stim on everyone and give everybody a bad massage. Um, And that's all fine uh, for the lowest level of person seeking uh, health and uh, pain-free movement, but for the most part, we want to deal with people who are the more competitive mover. And those people uh, need to be loaded in the correct directions. We need to manipulate uh, plane of loads. We need to, we need to uh, manipulate a uh, base of support to get these people back to um, you know, doing that soul-filling activity they want to do. Um, and so the pain Jedi, I thought, became an approachable term, and it told someone immediately when they could – uh, benefit from speaking to us. They go, okay, you're, you're fun. You obviously don't take yourself too serious. Um, and if I hurt, I know where I'm going to go. And so the pain Jedi was born. And I love that because, you know, traditional physical therapy, a lot of times, you, you know, you focus on having people understand the chain and how everything is affected. So many people don't realize, you know, I may have a shoulder issue because it really may have originated in my core or I may have a foot problem or a knee problem that's showing up, you know, in dysfunctions and, you know, overcompensations in other parts of the body. And so that's why I love guys like you, because you're really re-educating not just athletes, but most of the, of the public, they just don't understand how everything affects everything else. And so with that being said, what is your protocol when somebody comes in and they say, I have a pain here, or I have dysfunction here and it's, it's keeping me from athletic performance. How do you assess that? What's that look like? Yeah, we've developed something we call the launch method. Uh, It's an acronym we use. It's a four-step process. And I think anyone that practices, and this is going to be a technical term, warning, Mm -hmm. uh, biopsychosocial medicine, and that could be physical therapist, a chiropractor, a personal trainer, a physiatrist. It could be any number of these people. Um, That means that you understand that there are layers to pain some of which are relative to, let's say, joint mobility, uh, muscle tension, uh, practiced nature of a certain movement. Um, All that kind of goes together on top of uh, someone's overall fear of being in pain, which we know uh, really can exacerbate people's pain experience. And so uh, understanding where people are coming from and how they understand their own pain and unpacking that bit really by itself does a terrific job of decreasing pain. So we use the launch method and uh, the L stands for listen. Uh, When I present it in talks, the L is huge. It is the most important part. And whenever I'm working with uh, new physical therapists or PTs who are new to having this much time with people, um, I try to uh, make the analogy that, you know, in PT school and in your normal training, you have very little time. So you stand down the fi- down the barrel when someone's delivering their subjective about here's when it hurt, why it hurt. And you're just taking all this information in. And the skill is continuing Uh, allowing that person to continue to speak and kind of standing to the side and just picking out the nuggets that, Mm. okay, yes, that's germane to this problem. That is relative. Yeah, this part maybe we'll unpack later. Um, So once we've listened to everything, then we have to acknowledge. That's the A. So we listen and then acknowledge because if I say, all right, I've heard what you said, and you're all wrong, your doctor's an idiot, and the person you saw before (laughs) is an idiot, I've already lost. I've lost. Um, I have to acknowledge where that person's coming from. Um, Probably explain and unpack. That's the next bit of the acronym. um, Why they believe that? You know, why that headline and a Twitter feed made them think that? And okay, like so, part of that is real. Part of that is right. But here's why it doesn't apply to you. 
or he, and, and let me show you why. So we listen, we acknowledge, we unpack, and then we challenge. So whether a challenge could be a special test, quote unquote, special test, uh, my physical therapy colleagues roll their eyes when I say, it. Um, you know, it could be a, a functional movement. It could be loading them in a certain way and see if we can't exacerbate their pain. It's like, does that hurt you? All right. So now let's try it this way. And so we are testing and challenging the system and then we retest and then we treat something else and challenge again. So this launch acronym is something that our physical therapists do um, kind of automatically now. But whenever I teach uh, new PTs or PTs who have been doing it who want to be sort of a what we call a next gen PT, um, this launch protocol is a terrific way to get started and uh, set a baseline for all the planning that you're going to do to get them back to whatever they like. I love that because some of the things you're talking about, you know, you have a lot of doctors out there who really, you know, they're, they're great people, you know, but they are not necessarily interested in helping somebody get back to peak athletic performance. You know, they're more about treating symptoms a lot of times. Let's get you out of this pain, but not really make you functional again. And so I love that, that you're really describing that, you know, what your doctor may say, not that he's wrong, but there's another side to that that we have to look at. Um, what are some of the most important things when we talk about pain management, what are the most, um, the things that you think are the most important as far as treating that pain after you've made that assessment? Um, well, you know, understanding that everyone, uh, every person who comes into your clinic or you see on the gym floor, uh, is an N of one. Um, they may have the exact same pain you saw come in yesterday with this person who has a herniated disc and you go, well, herniated disc, got to be, right? And you start the process of asking the questions, um, the red flag signs for that, and you go, well, I, I don't know, why this doesn't fit? Um, but one of the things that was useful to us early on, especially uh, when we started what we do, um, was having the amount of time to do the launch thing, challenge something, and then be wrong. Mm -hmm. The amount of times we were wrong actually helped us sort of uh, understand our pattern recognition a lot better. So we would make a guess and say, okay, we think this is an osteochondral defect of the patella. In short, arthritis behind the kneecap. And we'd say, well, let's test this out. And every all, all the tests would come out right, but then you'd load them and, oh, I didn't expect you to be able to jump on that, that box or step on that, that height. I was not correct. Now, here's the cool thing. Uh, because I had so much time one-on-one, -on -one, I was able to just do the next thing on my list. Uh, all right, I, that was incorrect, so let's go to this one. Ah, all right, that was where I made a mistake. I didn't look at this area. Um, this person isn't just like the person I saw yesterday or last week, so now it tweaked my ability to uh, uh, understand that pattern and then alter care immediately uh, instead of, oh, man, we messed up, so I guess I'll see you in four days when you mm. run around on that bad knee and compensate with your left QL going crazy, and now you got back pain on top of your knee pain. Um, that doesn't help anybody out. Uh, but unfortunately, that is the direction many of my colleagues are forced to work in. Um, I'm pretty confident that if I were to take any physical therapist out of any clinic that operates in that way and drop them in here, they would they would adopt launch and they would immediately um, be able to recognize patterns a lot better because they could ask the right questions and do the correct movements. So that's a big important thing on how you're how we're dealing with pain differently and how we're trying to educate people differently. Yeah, and I keep coming back to that. You're educating people. You're not just giving them a prescription or just some, here's some exercises you do. It, it's not just what you do, but why you do it. And I think right. that's what makes, you know, guys like you so valuable to the industry and why, you know, you're a life changer as far as that goes. So we, we talk about, you've probably seen, seen it all, but what are the <laughs> most common injuries you see with people coming in, you know, time and time again, this seems to be a reoccurring theme here as far as injuries. Yeah. Uh, there is no doubt that low back pain is by far the most common area that sort of uh, drives people to seek treatment. A lot of other things, you know, like you were saying earlier, uh, you know, when you've played sports at a high level, when you've competed at a high level, you know things are going to break down, uh, speak to you from time to time, and you sort of understand that's part of the game. I get it. Um, but uh, people don't ignore low back pain for a long time. Um, but as you were saying, uh, it isn't uncommon to find a reason for that trunk pain, that side pain, that you know, hip slash back pain to be generated from a loss of power, a leak of power elsewhere. 
So, you know, we'll do all manner of manual therapy or you know, movement therapy and, and functional movement assessment and adjust, address that back pain. But we got to say, why did this happen? Why is your right so as like, going crazy here. It doesn't make a lot of sense given the, your ability to move in this way. Oh, I see. There's a, a leak in your scapular thoracic area. So you're generating power. Your feet are grabbing power. You're rotating around an axis. And then all of a sudden, the thing, the ball, the, the javelin, the heavy bag, um, you're ready to hit it, but your body realizes we've lost power elsewhere. We've lost something. Let's exert from my shoulder muscles, you know, north of my scapula. And you do that enough, and now you're asking for this reverse um, stability to occur. Instead of from the ground up, it kind of comes backwards. Uh, it's like shooting a bow without an arrow in it. Um, so you find these little leaks, and, uh, you know, you can address them. People go, well, yeah, you know, I came from my back, right? You remember my back hurt? <laughs> but see, and if we understand, and we have a plan to address that pain, and we're going to educate you on how to um, address this yourself as well. But I think that the leak is from here. And then, again, because we've got time, we could say, let's go back to that movement that hurt your back. Oh, all of a sudden, your back pain is less. Cool. If it wasn't, then I was wrong, and we move on to the next guess. Um, but that's a big one, low back pain, and it, it happens a lot in our rotary power athletes. Uh, and by virtue, anyone who tries to, you know, grab power from the ground and get it to the top. So like a you know, discus throwers and everything like uh, similar to that. So can we talk about that a little bit with, you know, the most common things that you see? Why do you think that is, you know, we see so many things over and over again, like low back pain. Is it because of overcompensation? Is it lifestyle, like our modern lifestyle? I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've seen, you know, over the last five or six years, that just have chronic pain all over their bodies, you know, do you think that some just because of our modern lifestyle, texting, you know, having the hunched over posture, like what do you attribute a lot of the, the pain? And as well as I love that you're talking about leakages in power, what, what do you kind of, you know, see as the, the big potential reason that we're seeing so much of that? It's prevalent today from young kids on. I mean, it's like yeah. high school athletes on up. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you on that. And I think the biggest reason is because uh, many of us, I would say, uh, and this is probably why most physicians say, oh, we'll just stop doing that. Don't don't do that. Um, you know, let's say you're a runner or a cyclist and you're a busy, you know, 40 some year old with some kids like I am. And um, you uh, have a couple hours. So you're going to go hit the bike. And maybe you sign up for a race and you might cycle some more. Uh, and then your training volume goes up a little bit and you maybe I'm going to do more hills. I'm going to do some sprint repeats. Or I'm going to work some fart lake work and running and then I'm going to go back on the bike. But the lack of loading your nervous system and loading your axial skeleton has become greater. We've stretched ourselves so thin. If you have an activity, like let's say it's cycling, um, that's what you do. Your free time, you go cycle. You don't strength train to cycle. You just cycle. Uh, runners, uh, hey, you know, you probably should uh, come and you know, get, a, get a program to improve your hip power, your uh, single leg stance ability, your rotary power. Um, well, why do I do that? I'm just running. Yes, yes, I understand. But you came in with knee pain of a rotary nature, and we need to improve your rotary or anti-rotary ability so that – you don't lean on the inside of your knee when you're running. It'll also make you a more effective runner because the less energy you're expending trying to keep your external rotators on, the more north and south energy you have. So it will make you a better runner, but it doesn't always hit everyone the same. It, only the top level um, actually do this. And it's why you only remember a percent of a percent of the names who are famous runners because they're the ones willing to put that work in. So the majority of folks, um, you know, I got time to run. I'm going to go run. I got time to play golf. I'm going to play golf. But why does my back hurt? Well, I kind of told you 10 things you're not doing that the guy you remember is a terrific golfer is doing every day. So um, I'm a huge proponent of strength training in all of its forms. I would say that in the past as a maybe 20 something year old trainer, I would have said, well, CrossFit's stupid or yoga's stupid and have a very ridiculous opinion on uh, all these other modalities. And the reality is whatever strength training you enjoy, that's the best strength training there is. Mm -hmm. If you love RDLs, go and load them, go and do them frequently. If you love snatches, if you love swings, um, yeah, but I hate the leg, you know, I hate leg presses or I hate squat. Okay. They don't squat. Or I love front squats, but I don't like low bar back squat. Okay, then don't do a low bar back squat. That's fine. Um, but that kind of loading is so important, not only to prepare the body for the kind of loads you want to impart and prevent leak, but to load the nervous system. People who have very chronic chronic pain, uh, what I usually find is 
they don't bombard their nervous system with input very often. In fact, they see that as offensive. Oh, if I do that, I'll hurt. And then they that's sort of the beginning of the biopsychosocial thing. Oh, well, if I hurt, I will be incapable, and I'll be incapable, then I can't do that thing I like. Oh, and then it'll make me hurt if I try it again. So it's this big cycle. And if you can get someone in front of you and really listen and really acknowledge their position and unpack these little bits that they come up with that are barriers to exercise, man, they'll take to loading. And then all of a sudden, oh, I don't like squatting. My doctor said don't squat. Okay, well, we're going to try this. It's a step up. How about that? Same movement, just one leg. It's not different. Oh, I don't mind that. Oh, the doctor said I can't lunge. I said, well, well, okay. Let's see. Do a lunge. Do a back lunge. Do a side lunge. Is that does that hurt you? Well, now, if if the doc was trying to just get a point across that doing lunges poorly is bad for you, well, then he's then congratulations. He was effective. <laughs> he stopped you from lunging. But I would, I would gather that any exercise done poorly is bad for you. I mean there isn't a person in the world who trains at the, at the level that you do or the level that I have seen that doesn't understand that. So once you can really explain that out and slowly introduce this strength training and axial loading and get people to understand that their central nervous system needs these inputs, it turns their little pain dial down. What used to require a 2 out of 10 for them to feel very major pain, well, now it's like a 6 out of 10 that they need to feel because – They've been imparting that sensation, that those stimulus to themselves and in a way that's not threatening and not uh, painful. And so that's how they become used to these loads. And all of a sudden, like, well, I can run and I can do that strength training thing. And now, now that knee injury is gone, too. That's fantastic advice. And, you know, it's so interesting because I a lot of times see long distance runners and, you know, they're young and they've got the hips and the glutes of an 80 year old man. Uh, so <laughs> these are so important. Yes. You know, like you're talking about is to make sure there's not overcompensations. And, you know, as I'm hearing you right, you know, so you're talking about loading the nervous system and actually training the nervous system. Do you think that there's value to to like training the vestibular system, proprioception, you know, balance, things like this that would help athletes also stay out of pain? Of course. Of course there are. Um, there are a couple things that we sort of um, – try and impart on every athlete or, you know, any competitive mover we see. I, I wouldn't consider a 75-year-old golfer, uh, you know, a uh, pro athlete, but that uh, that person wants to golf and play and, and be pain-free. Um, and so we would impart on them that you add to your movement account. We speak about things in kind of a movement economy sort of thing. Um, you want a big, fat movement account. You want to be able to draw from that account doing the activity you like uh, as much as possible without overdrawing your account. When you overdraw your account, that's pain or some kind of failure in this system. Well, when we are uh, strength training, when we are practicing, when we are working on our balance and our coordination, working on our nutrition and our sleep hygiene, we stuff our account. The longer we go where our account is, let's say, deficient or low, uh, the more likely you are to get injured. And so when we uh, break down, you can break down any movement, really, of the golf swing, um, there are single leg uh, balance and proprioceptive components to that. There are, uh, of course, trunk rotation components. There are mobility components. Um, it's real hard to have a full backswing if you have half the thoracic rotation to the side of your backswing. So, well, we explain here's an important bit about being a powerful golfer, about how you need to sense this full rotation of your trunk over your hips, how your feet have to be square and firm in the ground. Um, and you can break down any movement in this way. Um, but that proprioception is built in there. Um, that same person, we might do a lot of tandem stance work, uh, tight, we call them tightrope stance or strain tracks stance. And again, like I said earlier, manipulating their base of support and manipulating the, the uh, direction in which resistance is coming, creating anti-rotation forces and anti-side bending forces so that when you want to rotate, you rotate. And when you don't want to rotate, you do not, and you're sperm, and you've got a tight coil. Um, so those are all bits that uh, play in everyone's plan of care, whether you're coming in just to improve your performance or you have back pain that's being uh, caused by leakages and things like that. So proprioception is terrific. Vestibular power is terrific and something you can train. Um, I mean there's uh, emerging science on uh, all kinds of uh, visual motor um, uh, components and uh, as far as uh, you know, the biohacking bit, I'm sure you could speak for hours about all the ma uh, many different things that you can do to improve um, the like or decrease the likelihood that you have leakages and your training can be more effective. This is pure gold for those of you who are really listening. This is good stuff that you can apply 
because you know not everybody has access to go to a physical therapist at this point. But just starting to even look and research the things that Dr. Carlos is sharing with you, I mean, this is this is gold today. So, how important is prehab to you? Oh man, that's uh, you know the bedrock of any uh, program. Um, you know, typically uh, every season is sort of this wheel that we imagine. Um, when someone wraps up a season, uh, let's say a baseball athlete wraps up in uh, October ish. Um, we want to uh, sort of reassess all of the bits that go into throwing a baseball, hitting a baseball, running the bases, those kinds of things. And so there's a transitional period where we're recuperating. We are under, uh, getting a baseline for hip mobility, trunk mobility, all of the mobility that uh, and strength that um, degrade over the course of a season. And that can be said for any athlete. Um, during the course of a competitive, let's say the competitive year, which could be two months to eight, um, everyone gets weaker. Everyone gets slower. Everyone gets smaller. The, the best of us are just the ones who get weaker slowest. Those are the ones who don't get hurt. Those are the ones who can maintain their ability throughout the course of a year. But at the end, you need to say, okay, where are we now? And that sets our prehab baselines. Okay, so we lost a little bit of power in our lower trapezius, our ability to um, really centrate our humerus during this phase of throwing. All right, so we're going to work that in for a few weeks of this period. And then our off-season programming starts where we're going to load you, we're going to move you low, we're going to do, uh, we're going to kind of thicken that padding, that strength layer. Uh, so this is another sort of prehab thing uh, theme that plays right into an off-season program and then the understanding for this athlete that as we approach a portion of the year where we need to pick up pace we need to improve we need to increase ground touches we need to improve rotary uh, power well you've got to draw that from something you actually have to build that layer of power and strength and unilateral uh, explosiveness so that you can begin rotating off of that if you didn't build that over the course of your the first phase of your offseason you're going to run that movement account down before you even start playing. Yeah. So uh, it's understanding uh, the directions you need to challenge someone. The Again, the planes, the base of support, the uh, variety uh, that changes the proprioceptive demand. And then as they approach a season, um, you might do much more uh, speed, power, rotary movement, explosivity, um, and sort of come off of doing you know heavy, heavy deadlifts or you know snatches overhead and things like that. So um, – you know, that prehab is constantly informing our decisions uh, based on the activity for the entire program. Fantastic stuff. And, you know, we have heard for years, I mean, it's been popular for years, you know, heat, we talk about muscle stem and all its different forms has been around for a while. But the thing that's making a big uh, comeback and it's kind of been the hot topic and buzzword is cryotherapy. So what are your thoughts on ice baths and cryotherapy? Uh, you know, all of those modalities are terrific. Uh, they they have a use. Um, the only issue that uh, people like myself uh, who um, also have an eye on the human performance side, not just the pain side, is that when people take uh, these therapeutic modalities and kind of cowboy them up a little bit, you know, uh, uh, ice is terrific. Heat is terrific. Uh, the literature would tell you that it doesn't matter which one you use, uh, whichever makes you feel good, whichever gets you off of the plinth and moving and loading yourself again, uh, quickest is the modality for you. I would say that I have never seen, uh, nor would I uh, apply a heat to something that's actively inflamed. Let's say you're immediately post-op mm. uh, or you're having an infection issue in something like that and we want, to, want that to calm down. Um, ice would be my clinical uh, go-to. Um, but after that initial inflammatory phase, uh, it really is a preference thing. Um, I would say that uh, ice uh, generally uh, is used well, but maybe not optimally. People may leave ice on too long. I've seen people get bad ice burns because they put something much too cold directly on their surface of their skin and left it on for an hour. I'm like, well, that's behind, that's against everything we know about how you should use this. And so just a little bit of knowledge on well, what's the optimal way to utilize this modality uh, goes a long way. Um, BFR is another one uh, where uh, it's a terrific modality. If you're not familiar with blood flow restriction, I would look it up. Uh, has nice research behind it. Uh, and the idea in clinic is that it's terrific for um, assisting people with uh, peripheral tendinopathies. Think um, uh, jumper's knee. Uh, think uh, golfer's elbow. Uh, areas where the, the medicine is loading 
loading hurts sometimes, especially in those in those uh, instances. So if you can apply a tourniquet force that decreases that increases the amount of pressure necessary for blood to leave a limb, the amount of activity that is required to get the biochemical milieu, the environment in that area, to be um, uh, health bringing, um, is very low. So let's say you could, you know, hammer curl thirty five pounds. Well, man, that really bothers my brachioradialis. It hurts my my elbow here uh well let's tourniquet you find the pressure that's necessary and let's do this with three pounds three pounds is not enough to hurt anybody um but you're still delivering the same biochemical change in that area so for those peripheral tendinopathies it it works amazing but then you see guys at the gym bench pressing you know two pies on each side and they got bfr cups on their arms i'm like i'm pretty sure that is not what that's for oh man i get a sick pump yes i understand but you don't clearly understand how this works um, let me just explain a couple of things. And, you know, you might be able to use BFR in that way, but it isn't the optimal way. It isn't the way that's designed. And so that's the only issue. Uh, cryotherapy is terrific. I mean, the cryo chambers are great. Um, you've seen, uh, man, if you watched Hard Knocks some, <laughs> I think last year where Antonio Brown burned his feet off. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that happened. I don't either. But it, but, but that can happen. <laughs> yep. That absolutely can happen. Um, ice baths are terrific. People uh, see their favorite athlete in an ice bath and they think, all right, I got to do ice baths. How long do you do ice? 20 minutes. I'm like, no, no, like three. That is direct contact. The coldest cold. If you're in there more than four minutes, you're going to deal with problems. <laughs> so uh, understanding the applicability to what you're trying to do is the most vital bit of that. And I think um, just seeking the, the expertise of you know any uh, physio, any uh, physician, anyone who you would trust um, has an eye on your performance as well is probably the best first step to using that all correctly. And just I, I, what I like what you're saying is to be educated on the modality that you choose. You know, I, I think BFR is a huge thing right now. But, you know, we're talking, I tell people when they want to do this, we're talking loads that are 20, 30 percent high reps, you know, you don't go in there, you try and max out with BFR no. bands on, you know, but that's what people are doing. They have no yes. idea that, you know, the, the stressor will take care of itself, you know, and the same thing with um, all the, the muscle stems out there, you know, I watch people like try and use a TENS unit, like a muscle stem, don't understand there's a big difference. Uh, yeah. AC stem versus DC, you know, and I, yeah. we have a DC, uh, stem here, but you can only use it very short periods of time or your skin's going to fry. So, you know, it, it's, it's people have to understand that, you know, these different modalities. And I, I think this is what's so great. If you're listening here, take this advice from Dr. Carlos that you have to be, you know, educated on the mode that you choose the modality, um, because they're all good, but you have to be educated. And so that that's a huge lesson right there. I, I think that's just gold again. Uh, how important is mobility just in general? Like I said, for guys like me, you know, I'm 48 right now and I spend, you know, the first 20 minutes of my workout is, is all mobility. I would have never thought about mobility 15 years ago. I mean, I would go right in, let's put 315 on the bar for our warm up set, you know, and right. it's just a totally different thing. And we're becoming much more aware of that. How important is mobility? And then the second part to my question is that how, how important is loaded mobility in your view? Yeah, um, mobility is uh, very important. I mean, at, at our age, uh, you got to warm up for the warm up now. <laughs> um, so, but it's all about movement preparation. Um, you know, telling your nervous system, okay, we have access to this much of our shoulder today. And that's going to change depending upon your previous workout, depending upon uh, your nutrition, depending upon your sleep hygiene, depending upon your overall pain. Um, that will change day to day, week to week. Um, so introducing mobility training is about telling your brain, okay, we've got this much room today. Um, you can do mobility training with a partner and introduce new end ranges of motion. You can tell your hip, hey, we got a couple more degrees of external rotation today, and today we've got a rotary power day, so we might be able to go a little bit um, crazier when it comes to our med ball wall slams or uh, some of our landmine work. All right, terrific. Um, if you're figuring that out on the way, let's say you just slap three pies on and you start to squat and you go, man, my hip feels like garbage today. It's like, well, you would have known that earlier. 
And instead of loading an area where your body was not prepared um, to receive that uh, input, um, you're you're much more likely to uh, avoid injuries like that. So um, the amount of mobility, I mean, I think if uh, you had a guest on uh, a short time ago, and I really enjoy your podcast, by the way, so oh, I did have to you. mention that I do, I do listen and it's terrific, um, that um, if you had a choice and you had a limited amount of time, um, you got to choose mobility. Uh, because you can also load, as which you had asked earlier, those same mobility planes. So, all right, I've only got 20 minutes today. I got a flight to catch. I had to do a PowerPoint or whatever, and so I'm, I'm running short on time. Um, that is the stuff that's going to add to that movement account. So the next time you can load, that mobility will be there. Instead of just loading, figuring out along the way you didn't have it that day in the shoulder, in the neck, in the back, or whatever it was, uh, and then run into problems. Uh, so it's extremely important, and loaded mobility is great because it, it can actually introduce new areas of uh, mobility, of movements that your body is prepared to then load and be explosive from. Oh, excellent. And so carrying that over then to strength training, whether it's strength training, functional training, whatever that may be. What do you think are the biggest mistakes you see people making today? Like, where do people get it wrong? You know, Joe, Joe Blow out there is listening today and he's like, you know, COVID's hit. You know, I want to get in shape. I'm going to start strength training. I ordered a bunch of weights or I ordered a bunch of kettlebells, whatever it may be. What are the biggest mistakes that you see uh, people making with their strength and functional training? Um, you know, the reality is it's unfortunate because it's just frequency. It's consistency. Um, you know, everyone who bought, uh, four kettlebells and a set of pile boxes and a bench, um, was excited when they came in. Hell, I get excited when I get a new piece of equipment. I do <laughs> it's like the only thing, it's the yeah. only thing I'll train on for like a month. It's like, I love this freaking echo bike or whatever. Um, but you know, uh, you sort of lose that you lose, uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe people, uh, don't immediately see the gains they thought they were going to get, or they realize, man, swinging a a bell is not easy to do. I mean, it's chewing up my hands, my back hurts because when I get tired, it's like, well, you know, so finding those ways to stay consistent, I think is the biggest mistake people don't make, uh, people do make. And that, um, you know, when they lack that consistency, they get upset and wonder why, well, I got all this equipment. How come I'm not in shape? It's like, well, it doesn't work by osmosis, you know, doing it, even if it's on a day where I feel tired or I have a little pain, like go through the motions. You know, load the mobility. Um, think of something that wouldn't uh, necessarily attack your nervous system, and make you feel like, oh, this is so much work. Well, you know, there are other ways to train. You know, if a uh, back squat's bothering you, front squats are great. You want to do goblets, you want to do uh, offset loaded with just rack position in one hand, terrific. Um, you know, think about range that day. Think about adding rotation to uh, a squat that you never tried. Um, but yeah, being consistent is the number one thing. If I could flip a switch and, and all of a sudden everyone's training three days a week, man, we would solve a lot of problems. Um, I would say that when someone comes in and says, well, yeah, I run every day. I mean, <laughs> I listen to people talk about what they do and I, I know what they mean. Oh, well, mm -hmm. you know, I like to work out with weights, you know, like twice a week and I do yoga every day and I run four days a week. Okay. That means you train with weights once every third week, yeah. you do <laughs> yoga twice a week and you run like once a month. But that's what that means. Like I know you know the right answers. I know you, you could ask anyone, you could ask the most overweight, out of shape, um, you know, one foot in the grave person out there. Tell me 10 healthy things to eat. Tell me five good exercises. They're not going to be wrong, but the knowledge at that point isn't the problem. It's doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a lot of barriers to that. And that's another thing we try to do is, you know, let's unpack these barriers. Is this a real barrier? Are you really having this kind of pain? Okay, let's address that. Is it a made up barrier? Do you lack a, a goal? Well, let's set a bunch of little goals. That's super easy. And then you get, get excited about, oh, I met that little goal. Cool. I met my week two goal. Like now that just puts you one step closer to your month four goal which is terrific. Um, so that's an important thing I think people can do. Uh, any one of us could do. Any, any one of us professionals can help others do. It's like, let's set up 10 little goals on the way to your big one and, uh, and concentrate on those. And that's such great advice because we have so many people that say, okay, I missed three workouts this week, so I got to make it all up in one day. And then <laughs> yeah. they can't walk for a week. You know, I, I talk to guys that do leg day. They're like, I missed three days this week, so I trained legs really bad. And, and now they're out for another week and a half because they can't walk or move or get out of bed. So that right. consistency is just such great advice for everybody out there. Um, it's, it's those small steps, you know, take you to those, those yeah. little goals like you're talking about. 
I mean, I hope people are writing this stuff down. I am. I'm making notes all over my paper right here, everything you're saying. So awesome. I understand that you study jujitsu. So how did you get involved in that? How does the pain Jedi go, you know, get involved in something where you're inflicting pain upon other people? You know, it is a terrific uh, sales mechanism for my business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, well, so, uh, as I said before, I'd played, uh, some collegiate baseball. Um, I, I guess in my thirties or so, I figured, um, I'm, 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 I was coaching at a very high level as well. Uh, baseball specifically, uh, a lot of the speed and explosivity aspects of baseball and then the prehab aspects. Um, and I figured, you know, my body was taking, uh, was getting a beat up a little bit as well. You know, I, I did, I do think I was one of those who, who did train to play baseball. I hit at a cage. I, uh, took, fungos i i worked at the craft for as long as i could but at, at a point um you know you have a job you have children you got responsibilities and so the extra work that goes into being that kind of a competitor goes to the wayside and then now it's the problem we discussed earlier it's like i got free time i got three games this week that's what i'm gonna do um and so it took a toll i needed to find a competitive outlet that was um a little less impact um I had a colleague of mine who had uh, begun trying some jujitsu and uh, some striking. I said, I can get into that. And uh, man, I just fell in love with the, the chess, um, the active uh, mind game, which uh, jujitsu is. Uh, I've been doing it since 2006. Uh, I did take a break in there for a little bit when I went to PT school, but otherwise I've been back uh, full time and uh, I'm at a Gracie location here in uh, Northern Virginia. Um, a terrific family, great group of people to train with. Uh, and so, yeah, now it's funny because when I train with someone, it's like, well, you, you, you've really attacked the shoulder a lot. So, yeah, I know because you saw me two weeks ago. I know your shoulder's messed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, awesome. I'm, I'm going to win. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it really is the most cerebral thing when we talk about martial arts that you're saying. And I, I think that's why I respect martial artists so much because you're always thinking one step ahead or how to counter what's happening, you know, how that has to light up your brain, your reflexes, the mentality, the training that it takes to do. And, you know, speaking of kind of some of the results of that, what should people know about cauliflower ear and how to treat it? I mean, I've worked with wrestlers over the years, fighters. It seems to be really symptomatic. You know, wrestlers never want to wear the headgear in practice, you know. Um, how do you, you know, what should people know about this? Oh, good question. I love talking about it. It's um, uh, you have to recognize when it's first become an issue. Um, the basic anatomy is pretty simple. Y you have this sort of uh, scaffolding in your ear, and you have this skin that just wraps it up. And because there's no um, hard backing, uh, there's no joint space, there's sort of nowhere for blood to go. So if you start bleeding, it's just going to bleed, and it's going to mm. puff your ear up. Um, most people uh, recognize that that initial burning that hot ear you know so if you're practicing a certain technique or a certain takedown and you're constantly wearing that side of your head um you just go yeah my ear is a little tender it hurts to sleep on it it's not really puffed up yet but um you know it really is irritated um the first thing people can do is just well eliminate the offending thing so let's say now you're just going to practice that takedown on the other side people don't want to do that for some reason um apply pressure um, uh, there's a, there are some products out there, uh, that I endorse, uh, I endorse, but I certainly don't get anything for. I just think there are some really elegant solutions, uh, where it, uh, you're not going to get an infection by putting a clothes. I mean, you get people putting clothes, pins and binder clips on the ears and it's, I've seen some horrific infections. Um, uh, if I may, uh, the company that is called Colicure. Um, it's terrific. Uh, it's these little uh, earth rare earth magnets wrapped in this medical grade silicone um i keep a kit in my bag if i get a hot ear i just slap them on you put a little bit of bacitracin so they can move around and that compression uh moves the blood sort of away from the scaffolding and allows the skin to just seal back up where it's supposed to go if you get that kind of compression whether you use a colic cure kit or you use a clothespin which i wouldn't recommend um you know that should be enough uh 24 hours 48 hours of keeping that compression on there uh, really is very effective uh you shouldn't have that much of a deformity in your ear um you know and then if you ignore those signs that's kind of on you but you know that's where you'll get uh the ear to actually like pop 
Mm -hmm. um, where you have excessive bleeding, enough where just the, the tension of your skin on that scaffolding is not sufficient to keep the blood out, and that's where you have that kind of big gnarly ear. Um, this, the rules are still the same. You still want to apply compression, but you got to get that fluid out of there. And so you know, you'll know, you see a professional who can drain that. I would advise against um, immediately seeking like uh, a physician who doesn't understand that this is something that happens in this sport um, because they always want to, well, we got to – you know, wait till it hardens, cut it out, put these little stitch buttons in, and it becomes even much more of an environment for infection. Uh, and really, it doesn't fix the problem, nor does it educate the person on like, well, how can you get this to not happen again? Um, so once you understand the anatomy of the ear, it actually makes very good sense. Like, okay, yeah, I got it. So I got to push the skin back to touch that scaffolding. So there's some knitting up that happens. But if there's fluid in the way, I got to get rid of that. Um, so draining it with, uh, you know, with this very fine gauge needle, 30 gauge needles are usually used for this kind of thing. Um, fluid comes out very easily. It's usually just, you know, pus and blood and that kind of thing. And, and if you train long enough, you've had this happen to you. I've certainly had to drain my own, uh, and apply my colicure and whatever else. If it does actually, uh, require, um, uh, draining, you do need to keep the, some compression on for a little longer. And I think the most offensive time is sleeping. When you sort of change positions and don't realize it. So some form of wrap that keeps your ear nice and flush to your head is also very useful, even if actually you're, you didn't need to drain your ear. So that's another tip um, for people who are experiencing that hot ear, maybe like an ace wrap, something simple so that their ears don't fold up because uh, that can hurt and also restart that bleeding. Well, because you said it, I got to ask. So you talked Go about ahead. the rare earth magnets. OK, what is your opinion, you know, as because. I hear all different kinds of things. Um, what's your opinion on magnets, PEMF, you know, this kind of stuff? I mean, I'm, I'm very – I mean, I know if you if you can give just a 30-second a thing because it really is a hot topic. It is a very hot topic. Yeah. I don't know. I guess if you're listening, you can't see my face. <laughs> I don't know if I, I, don't know if I have 30 seconds to fill I, – I have not found – uh, real utility. I'm not saying that um, uh, y some folks might find some use. Uh, the literature is dubious at best. Um, however, I never talk talk ill of a modality that doesn't directly hurt someone. Mm. Like that is, if you're doing something that I know is dangerous, I will speak out that that is a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. Um, in the case of all kinds of um, you know topical modalities like these, um, it isn't going to hurt you necessarily. So if you believe it's causing you some relief, it's giving you some benefit, go to town. But if I do if I do manipulation and all of, and and your back pain is improving because we've done some good loading, please please you know, realize that that was the thing that worked and not likely, uh, you know, your copper glove or your magnet uh, infused whatever. Um, so that's my very long winded opinion. On it. I like that. Well, I think it's just saying is choose your modalities wisely. You know, if, if you are on a limited budget with modality, you know, choose, yeah. choose wisely. Um, because again, you, you can't always believe all the copy that you read in an article sure. or sure, something. Sure. So what what do you think you know talking about that what what does the future look like in the industry in terms of direction where do you see physical therapy where do you see athletic performance where do you see that heading in the future You know I think the future is is Close to now, um, there are a lot of uh, really, really talented uh, physios that have a very rich background in strength and conditioning, in Olympic lifts, in strong men, in jiu-jitsu, in MMA, in boxing, and all this other, uh, all these other uh, arts that people are picking up. Um, so I'm really excited to see more people speak about that crossover between uh, performance and uh, 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 pain, immobility, things that sap your ability to, to play. Um, and so I think that's what we're going to see more. Uh, I recently had a conversation with a group of uh, young um, PT students who, who also see themselves as uh, you know, what I consider next-gen PTs, you know, people who meld powerlifting and explosive training right in there with manual therapy. Um, and so that's encouraging. Uh, 
uh, it's really great to uh, be able to impart any amount of wisdom that I can, mistakes that I have made, things that have made me uh, you know, more aware of, of uh, the full picture. Uh, and that's what you're seeing. People are, are becoming more aware of the layers. And not just that, but I think the expertise is really in explaining these very difficult concepts in an easy way, developing 10, 15, 20 different stories that you can use mm. to describe why that person's brain is amplifying pain instead of attenuating pain, why that movement is not happening in the way they want because of this immobility down the chain somewhere. Um, and the more we can develop that ability, um, the brighter the future is for physios and future pain Jedis and, again, what we call the, the next-gen PT. So let me ask you this. For people that are listening out there and they don't really have access right now to physical therapy or they've been to a physical therapist in the past but it really – wasn't sports performance related. Are there any tools that you would recommend? We didn't talk about this part ahead of time, and that's why I feel about asking this question. But are there any basic tools or like basic things you say, here's some things that you should have for prehab in your home gym and how you, you know, you can start before you get into pain. How can we, you know, take care of some of these problems before they start? Are there any basic tools that you recommend? Um, from a from a manual therapy standpoint, man, there's so much out there, um, you know, and, and while my colleagues are probably going to cringe until I explain this out, uh, things, soft tissue techniques, uh, soft tissue tools like foam rollers and sticks and all these other kinds of devices um, are an interesting tool to have. Um, you know, the literature is going to be – is very clear. Uh, we are not going to change the mechanical properties of a lot of connective tissue with a foam roller. Mm -hmm. However – just as um, uh, putting my hands on someone has a uh, known mechanical effect if I do a certain thing, there are other reasons why pain is decreased from a non-mechanical effect. Um, I would say that uh, things like foam rollers and trigger point balls and all that stuff work have a similar mechanism. Um, you're causing pain. Uh, you're causing uh, no susception. You're giving input to a system and doing it in a way where it's like, well, I know this isn't dangerous. It's like a little ball on my shoulder. No big deal. And so I'm not afraid of that. I don't fear that pain. And it's a way to uh, play with your brain's ability to amplify or attenuate pain. Uh, that's really what the brain does when it, with these signals. It, pain, if I punch myself in the arm, I, I don't get that pain here. It's got to hit my brain. I've got to sense that as a, a problem. And then my body goes, all right, how scared should you be of this? That will deliver some pain uh, output. Um, well, if I can change that level where now I need to feel an eight before I get – before I feel something, uh, okay, well, I've done that. And you can do that with a foam roller. You can do that with a, with a ball. But the, to understand that, no, you're not stretching your IT band. No, you're probably not <laughs> yes. manipulating your trigger points. Like, it, you're just not. Uh, it's not possible with something from the outside like that. Um, but again, if you – feel it's move, improving your mobility, if you enjoy the sensation, if you feel like, yeah, I have less pain, go do it. It isn't going to hurt you. I just want people to understand like what is actually at play. So you can use any kind of uh, soft tissue tools. I think having a great ice pack, something that's kind of uh, mobile, uh, malleable, so you can use it on different parts. Um, understanding the basics on you know, how much ice, how cold, how much layering, those are all important things that everyone should just have a grasp of. Um, and as far as tools that improve our ability to load. Uh, I don't know that there's anything more versatile than a kettlebell. Uh, well, I know that there are things as versatile, and many people might disagree. Barbell is up there too. Hell, you can use a barbell in place of your foam roller. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, but uh, having those kinds of tools where you can learn okay, the basics of a front squat, the basics of a, a loaded carry, a farmer's carry, a waiter's carry, you know, how this all is supposed to uh, feed into your uh, ultimate goal of just doing that soul filling activity, whether it's golf or choking somebody unconscious you know so um those those are probably my basics you know kettlebells some soft tissue tools and understanding how to use them if, if nothing else that's the most important we, we got to have you on again sometime because just <laughs> absolutely when you're talking about you know people think that they're stretching their fascia and yeah you've heard uh, it all i'm just saying there's there's so much misinformation i love it when we can have somebody come on here and really present truth you know say doing something's better than nothing sure. but you know, having just a few tools, understanding the value of a tool, but a tool doesn't replace getting that manual therapy by somebody that knows what they're doing, especially yeah. <laughs> when you talk about that. Um, sure. 
So just any final thoughts that you can share with us? And then where can people go to learn more about you and your practice, especially with people that are over in the D.C. metro area? But just kind of sharing, you know, because you have all kinds of great stuff. Um, If you can share that with us, it'd be great. Of course, yeah. I think the number one thing, uh, most importantly, uh, is to get ahead of these little injuries. Understand that, you know, if it's golf, and I always reference the different things that we see, um, that there are requirements of different parts of your body to swing a golf club optimally and to be able to do it again and again uh, without drawing your movement account down to nothing. Um, so once you understand the importance of loading, how loading can play a role, anti-rotation, anti-side bending, whatever is the demand of the sport. Um, It'll, it'll make the sport or the game or, you know, whatever it is you like to do just more fun because you can concentrate on that and not be worried about, well, yeah, I'd like to play 18 holes, but man, my back is bothered me so bad for days after I can barely walk. Well, if we can eliminate that second part, oh man, isn't golf so much more fun? I mean, don't you want to go do it more, but you have to understand that work that goes in. So getting ahead of that by uh, giving yourself some knowledge uh, is probably the most important thing. Um, Using this kind of knowledge, I mean, the internet is a great place for information. Um, Good grief, though. There are so many people that uh, take a very uh, surface level of understanding and develop amazingly beautiful websites and have these huge followings. And, you know, you find out they're, barely a student in their master's program at some little school you never heard of. So I'm like, wait a second, you're a terrific social media guy, but you aren't even done with your education yet. <laughs> like, and it's like, okay, cool. I mean, thank you for, for bringing attention to this part of the field. But, um, you know, I'd love to see my colleagues do more uh, speaking out. Um, I am guilty of uh, sort of being afraid of getting trolled all the time. You know, I like to put information out there. We're available uh, on Instagram and Facebook, uh, Spark Physiotherapy is our handle there. Uh, and in particular, actually, we've got a group, like I told you before, that we are we care a lot about our jiu-jitsu players. Um, and mostly, I would say, you know, we, we see pro athletes across multiple sports. We have uh, several professional Muay Thai, MMA, and jiu-jitsu players who go out and compete very regularly. Um, and, you know, I get a lot of the same questions. I'm, I can't get on the mat without four people asking me about their neck. And that's terrific. I, there's nothing I enjoy more than answering those questions for people. So what we are doing uh, currently is developing a website. Essentially, it's WebMD for jiu-jitsu players. It's called awesome. the BJJ Physio. Um, it's uh, an area where people can just go get educated on what are the likely causes of their pain, uh, how long they should be in pain, and then in the end, spit out home programming not just to, you know, let's say exercise it away, but understand like, well, it's this injury, not this. It's this structure, not that. So now you'll get information on how to load this correctly, what movements you can do freely and, you know, feel like you can actually pr- play and practice and spar. But then these five things you want to avoid. Okay, no problem. And during that process, there's several weeks of programming that uh, are like healing early phase, loading kind of phase two, and then hardening phase three kind of programming. And we've got uh, hundreds of different programs there. Uh, it should be up this uh, around this summer is my hope. It's bjj-physio.com. And our Instagram is right now the only place where you're going to get that information. Uh, uh, that's just at BJJ Physio. Uh, and you can interact with us. I, I love answering questions, um, whether it's via email, or DM, uh, anything that I can do to help. And, and if, if you can't be near here, I mean, we know a lot of great therapists around the country and around the world uh, who, are, who would just be so excited to help people who are uh, looking to get back on the mat um, and, and play jujitsu as, as much as they'd like. Awesome. Well, I want to thank our guest today, Dr. Carlos Barrio, for investing in all of our listeners today. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure. I also want to thank our sponsors, ZionMissionaryChurch.net, NeuropowerSource.com, podcast producer, Drew Kiespert, film director, Jolyn Thomas, head of talent relations, Mr. Fairfax Hackley. Be sure to rate us and subscribe to the Pressing Limits podcast. For more ways to watch and listen to this podcast, check out the Pressing Limits podcast website.